I'll tell you, just God works in such, you know, he's really good at doing what he does. <laughs> I think he's had a few years of practice or something, but he is really good at it. And uh, I was in a conversation earlier today with somebody and we were talking about prayer. And I don't know, sometimes, maybe you're not like this, but sometimes when I come into a time of prayer, um, it's like I'm trying to wade through quicksand or something. You know, it's just... I know God's there, but it's like I can't get to him. And other times, oh, man, you walk in his presence. It's just incredible. And we were talking about that. And I was here at the church studying for tonight. And then I went home to um, get presentable. And uh, came back in and walked into the sanctuary here to pray. Oh, the presence of God was so beautiful. Yeah. Just in a moment's time. So, Brother Brandon, it works. <laughs> it works. There are times that's a little bit more of a struggle to get there. But there are times, those blessed sweet times, when he just envelops you with his presence. So I encourage all of us who are worshiping the Lord tonight, no matter where we are, that we open our hearts and our minds to the presence and power of God. Amen? Yeah. Amen. You know, the interesting thing about speaking to a group of people that you cannot see is that you don't know whether they're paying any attention. <laughs> so, and you also don't know if they just sort of check out. You know, when everybody's here, you can sort of, uh, I've been preaching and speaking publicly for more years than I care to, to remember, and you sort of can pick up on some clues like, you know, that maybe they're not paying attention, <laughs> but you can't see that when you guys are at home on your couches. So I would ask that you would just really energize yourself in the Word of God. We did send out some uh, summarized notes here because there are a number of verses tonight, some that I'm using from different translations, and I wanted you to be able to have them. And so if you, uh, hopefully you got the email, if you didn't get the email, if you check your email real quick on your phone, there's a PDF file there, and you can follow along with the scriptures. So I began studying yesterday afternoon and preparing, and, and I was working on something the Lord had been sort of bouncing around in my brain and spirit for a while, and uh, went to bed, I don't know, about 11 o'clock or so, and about 3 o'clock this morning, I woke up with this startling thought, and it was like, whoa, what is that all about? And I started to lay back down, thinking, Pastor Betcher, well, I'll remember that when I get up. Right. <laughs> yeah, no. You, uh, so I got up and I started jotting some notes here on my phone, just things as, as thoughts came to me in some scriptures. And so I want to talk with you tonight about Newton's laws. Uh, doesn't that sound exciting? Newton's laws. So there's a man by the name of Sir Isaac Newton, and he was a physicist and mathematician, and he lived long time ago in the 1600s. Uh, he's been referred to in, as by many as discovering the law of gravity. Well, you know, he didn't really discover the law of gravity. That's been around for a long time. God sort of instituted that. And there is a sort of a, I don't know what you call it, a myth, an urban legend, that he was sitting under a tree and an apple fell out of the tree and hit him on the head and, and he went, whoa, gravity. Um, it's not exactly the way it happened, but he began to study and research. Um, just as a little aside, if you know anything about Isaac Newton, um, one thing that most people don't know about him is that he wrote more about theology and about God and spiritual principles than he ever did about physics or math. Thousands of pages of writing about scripture. Uh, so he was a very dedicated believer in, in God. Um, but in 1687, he wrote a book called Philosophe Naturalis Principia Mathem Mathematica. That's all the Latin I'll ever be able to say. And in this book, he stated that there was three laws of nature, three laws of motion, as well as what he called the law of gravitation, which we would call the law of gravity. Now, we're not going to have a science class tonight. That's not what this is about. So all you high school people that are all going to worry, oh, no, here we go, physics and math. We're not going there. But, you know, I find it really amazing when you open the scripture, how many times God used things in the natural to explain or 
bring to our understanding spiritual principles. So the, the thought that came to me at 3 o'clock in the morning for some reason is, really, I woke up and this is the thought that was in my brain. A body at rest stays at rest. I was like, okay. Uh, my body was at rest. <laughs> And I would really like it for it to be at rest. So you woke me up for a reason. So it's like, as I said, I stayed up and I started jotting some notes. So these three laws state that if a body is at rest or moving at a constant speed in a straight line, it will remain at rest or keep moving in a straight line at constant speed unless acted upon by a force, an opposing force. So if you're sitting, you will stay sitting. If you're moving, you will stay moving unless something gets in your way or causes you to move when you were sitting. Now, that's deep and profound, right? It's called the law of inertia. The second law is a little bit more difficult, and fortunately, I'm not going to even talk about that one. It, here, here it is. So I think I put this in the notes to, that I sent out. The acceleration of an object is produced by a net force is directly proportional to the magnitude of the net force in the same direction as the net force and inversely proportional to the mass of the object. Whew, that's a mouthful. Oh, I'm glad he thought of that because that makes my brain hurt. <laughs> The third law is the one that woke me up, along with the body at rest. And for every action or force in nature, there is an equal and opposite reaction. So you at home couldn't hear that, but there was just a drop, and gravitational took over, and there was a force. So right now, as you're sitting or standing, or if you're in your living room cheering, for this great message that you're hearing, whatever it may be, uh, right now I'm standing on this platform. And the odd thing is, I don't feel it, I don't sense it, I don't know it, except I'm not floating off into space. But I'm exerting a pressure, a force, on this platform, which, interestingly enough, exerts a return in equal force on me. If it was unequal, either A, I would fall through the platform, or B, I would fly up in the air because of unequal force. It's really amazing because we walk every day. We live our lives every day. We, we put our glasses on the table. You know, I've got a bottle of water here and it's sitting on this thing. Without the laws of motion, we would have chaos. Right. It, it would be chaotic. Now, that doesn't really probably excite you very much, but remember that God created this. I find it so amazing that educated, trained, learned, really smart people have a problem understanding and believing in a creator of all things. This just happened by accident? This just, through a process of time, all of a sudden we came to these laws that Newton was so smart and, and intelligent to be able to determine? Just someday, floating out of space, all of a sudden matter came together, and we have this law of inertia, and we have the law that for every action and force in nature, there's an equal and odd. That just happened accidentally? No. The master designer, the creator of all things, the God of all gods, the Lord of all lords, the king of all kings, the sovereign one, the only one, he did all this with a spoken Word. Boom. Whew. Now, I, I read like six or seven different websites about these Newton laws before I could finally sort of, oh, yeah, okay, that makes sense. And I sort of make sense, you know, body at rest, moving, da 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 da, every action. So if I were to walk up to somebody and take and punch them in the face, there's some force there. And as my hand would connect with your face, if you allowed me to do that and didn't block it and beat me up, you know, there's some laws of motion that are taking place there. So the thing about this is this law of inertia really got me thinking, Brother Betcher. We understand it in the physical world. But if we're not careful, we can fall into the same law spiritually. So a body at rest, why do we hear every service? Remember to pray every day. And don't just pray, but connect with God.
And if I can make an addendum to that, make sure he connects with you. Right? Why, why do we say that? Because human nature is basically, by and large, lazy. Sorry. You know, most human beings look for the path of least resistance. You know what really troubles me or concerns me about our present time is that people, good people, good, well-meaning people who love God are going to lose out because they're sitting in inertia. <laughs> Probably didn't see that coming, did you? So here, Romans chapter 3, verse 23, a pretty well-known portion of Scripture talks about that for all have sinned. Can you say all have sinned with me? All have sinned. Now then, I did a, a years ago, I did a very exhaustive study of the Greek there. Uh, I, I spent seconds <laughs> looking at the meaning of the word all, and I was amazed to find out it means all. No loopholes. No tax evasion, no getting around it, no, hey, I got a buddy pass, none of that. It's all have sinned and come short of the glory, and that includes everybody that has ever lived or ever will live for all of eternity. So that includes me, and it includes y'all. Romans 2, 3.23, there's a lot of other scriptures that go with it. God doesn't lie. He's, he's not making stuff up. I find, you know, Paul is such an amazing individual. From where he was, well-learned, trained in all of the Jewish law, probably a very intelligent man, highly respected and regarded. And he wrote, you know, a little bit of the New Testament. He, he might have had a little bit of influence on Christianity, <laughs> right? A little bit. Romans chapter 7, verse 15 says, For that which I do, I allow not, and for what I would, that do I not, but what I hate, that do I. <clears throat> Sounds like one of the laws of Newton's laws. He goes on in Romans chapter 7, verse 19, verse 20 says, For the good that I would, I do not, but the evil which I would not, that I do. Now if I do that, I would not, and it is no more I that do it, but sin that dwelleth in me. If you're confused, don't worry about it. We'll get there. Then he goes on. He doesn't stop there. In the 23rd verse, he says, But I see another law in my members, warring against the law of my mind, and bringing me into the captivity of the law of sin, which is in my members. And then he says in verse 24, O wretched man that I am, who shall deliver me from the body of this death? That's Paul. Now, what, what was he saying? Well, Verse 15 in another translation says, What I don't understand about myself is that I decide one way, but then I act another, doing things I absolutely despise. That's a little easier to understand, I think. All right? He continues on in verse 18 through 20. I realize that I don't have what it takes. I can will it, but I can't do it. I decide to do good, but I don't really do it. I decide not to do bad, but then I do it anyway. My decisions, such as they are, don't result in actions. Something has gone wrong deep within me and gets the better of me every time. This is the Apostle Paul. The dude was like awesome. <laughs> He's saying this. Verse 23 and 24. But it's pretty obvious that not all of me joins in that delight. Part of me covertly rebel, and just when I least expect it, they take charge. <laughs> you think you're dead on the altar of sacrifice, but you got that right arm that's still hanging out there. <laughs> he says in verse 24, I've tried everything and nothing helps. I'm at the end of my rope. Is there no one who can do anything for me? Isn't that the real question? So if you're feeling today like no matter how hard you try to do right, you just can't get there, you got some really good company. Paul was there too. So do you ever feel like prayer, or Paul, in your daily prayer, where you set the alarm, today I'm going to get up five minutes early, and I'm going to spend that five minutes in prayer that I've been talking about. And you set the alarm, and you, the alarm goes off at five minutes early, and you hit the snooze. 
And you say, well, you know, pastor preached on Sunday, and he preached a, wow, that was a great message. And it was, by the way. And now I'm going to change my life, man. I'm going to get up at 5.30 in the morning when I normally get up at 7. I'm going to read the Bible, and I'm going to pray, and I'm going to seek God. I'm going to touch the throne of God. And 5.30 Monday morning comes, and you're nowhere close to the presence of God. Unless you say that you're laying before the Lord in meditation. <laughs> you hear some message about fasting and the discipline of fasting. And so you say, you know what? I really need to do that. Until you're driving down the road and you go past that billboard with that big juicy hamburger. And you go, man, oh. Or you go into work. Does this ever happen to you? Man, you're going to fast today and you go to work. And what do they do? Some horrible, terrible, rotten person <laughs> brings in apple fritters warm with that gooey stuff all over it. <laughs> well, I can fast tomorrow. You better. <laughs> hmm. How about you say, you know what? I really haven't been engaging in the Word of God as, as I should, so I'm really going to start. So you grab the Bible and you sit down and your kid comes over and pukes all over you. Sorry, that was a little graphic, wasn't it? And you go, duh! And you put the Bible down and poof, there it goes. Have you been there? Maybe not there, but it happens, believe me, uh, anybody with kids, you've been there, you're getting ready for church, you're all set, everybody's got their Sunday best on, ties tied, hair's combed, and one of the kids, bleh, right as you're walking out the door, right? If you don't have kids, well, just get ready. You hear a message about how that we are called to be witnesses, and you say, well, you know what? I'm going to go out and do that. And you see your neighbor who always throws his garbage in your yard. He lets his dog out into your yard, and the dog does his business. He's got a teenage son that drives this car with no mufflers. Every night, in our neighborhood, some guy comes home from work, drives down our 25-mile-an-hour speed limit road, and he's got some kind of car that's all, I think they call it pimped out, 11 o'clock, and he doesn't just drive down there easy, Brother Batcher, he, I mean, he's, he's going like 45 miles an hour down the road, it's like, oh, yeah, yeah. recompense him with the reward that he deserves, God, <laughs> bless him according to, how is that called, bless him, according to his works. Yeah, and then you're going to go witness to your neighbor. <laughs> really, what you want to do is strangle him. Am I being too honest here? See, Paul was there. I, I, I'm, I want to be careful about what I say next because I don't want to promote something. But I've, I found some leadership things that are secular, and they, they're just some really great leadership aspects. And I was listening to a, a, a live broadcast this morning. And the speaker was, had taken questions. They had sent in questions. One of the people had sent a question saying, he's a real estate agent from California. And he said, you know, I do really well. I stay on top of my goals. I'm out there. I'm, I'm aggressive. I'm getting, the, I'm getting the sales. And I'm doing really well. And then for some reason, I just sort of slack off. I take, I take a day off. You know, it's just like, it's like I lose all that momentum. Can you help me? How do I keep that going? I was amazed at the answer. He replied, and he said, well, first of all, you have to understand that we rarely do what we only say we want to do. How many people have ever said, boy, I want to lose weight? And never do. How many people have said, well, not everybody that's listening here has said this, but I have. I want to be a better husband. But you don't do anything about it. I want to become debt-free. Hmm. But you don't change your spending habits. Ouch. 
stop stomping on my toes. I was looking at Pastor Derek, but it wasn't him. See, we don't do. We say we want to do those things, but want doesn't motivate us. Stay with me. We're talking about Newton's law of inertia here. He also went on to say is that we really don't succeed on the things that we should do or ought to do. Everybody in church knows that we should pray. How often should we pray? Every day. Every day? Always? Without ceasing? We know we should. We know we should be involved in the Word of God. We know we should discipline our lives. We know we should spend time with our families. We know we should be a better spouse. We know we should be a better parent. We know we should be a better kid. We know, we know, we know what we should, what we should, what we should, but we rarely actually do anything that we know we should. He went on to say that the things that motivate us are the things that we must do. He explained that when he was young in real estate, that he had somebody tell him, well, if you want to keep those gold fires burning, go out and buy an expensive car. Now, the police don't do this. He was saying, this is bad advice, but the underlying principle works. Go out and buy an expensive car. Buy a big house that, can't, that stretches your budget, because now you can't slack off. You've got to go work. You've got to go make the sale of the other house. That's a terrible advice, but the underlying principle is true. Until we are, have some kind of motivation to cause us to change and get up out of our chairs and break the law of inertia, we will continue as we are. Can I tell you that if this time and this age that we're living in right now has not caused you to move off a dead center, I'm not sure what will. I'm not trying to be mean or nasty. I'm saying, look, as humans, I struggle with this too. It's a lot easier to sit on my couch, play Candy Crush, which I don't play Candy Crush, but a lot of people do. It's a lot easier sitting on my couch just thumbing through Facebook, which I got rid of off my phone because I was spending too much time on it, and it's a depressing, discouraging, desponding, absolutely awful place to be. And if, I was just going to say, Pastor Betcher, if you want to know how I really feel about it, see me offline. <laughs> oh. So what motivates us is the things we must be. So, and must do. Can I please implore you, all of you who are watching online, all of you at home, Hugh in the building, myself, can we say, can we come to a revelation from the power and spirit of God that says, that not only must I, but as Pastor Betcher preached about, I get to. It's my honor. It's my privilege. It's my opportunity to be in the presence of the Most High God. Why would I not want to? Because there's something within us as humans that says, I don't need God. It's called pride. It's called arrogance. It's called self-righteousness. All the things that should have died at repentance and been buried in the waters of baptism. But that old right arm comes flying back off the altar. <laughs> hallelujah. Somebody online say, hallelujah, so loud I can hear it. Ah, uh, you're not loud enough. <laughs> was, it, uh, was it last Sunday or last Wednesday that you were preaching, talking about have to do and that view of, that people have about the things in the Spirit? You know, sometimes we catch ourselves in these subtle mindsets that are so contrary to, to God. And we need to change our verbiage. We need to change our vernacular. We need to change our vocabulary or whatever you want to call it. We need to change our mindset so that when we approach the things of God, it's not from a negative standpoint. Oh, man, I got to get up early and pray. Yeah, you do. But only if you want to go to heaven. How many of you enjoy hanging out with friends? Family, well, maybe not that, but friends. <laughs> Nobody's in the building. You know, I, 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 I need to keep it under control here, Pastor Betcher. <laughs> um, how many like to fellowship with other believers? 
Well, come on. Every one of us loves that. Thank you, Brother Gentleman. I got to... You know, Pentecostals, if nothing else, loved fellowship. That's partly why this is so tough for us. You go to some religious organizations that I won't name, you know, they're in the door and out the door, and they're out smoking the cigarettes, you know, 22 seconds after they walked out the door. There's nothing there to, there's no community there. There's no family. When we come together, this is family. I haven't seen you all week, and I, I would love, Brother Ben, to run up to you and hug you and shake your hand. I can't right now, so I'll give you a passing high five or an elbow bump, but, you know, we love to fellowship. That actually causes some problems because fellowship usually includes food. <laughs> so we never preach about gluttony. <laughs> Do you sit down, Brother Jeremy, Jenin, and, you know, this morning you got up and you, and you got out your calendar and you looked at the calendar and the first thing on your calendar was make sure you talk to, or make sure I talk to Renee. And you go, oh, man, I talked with her yesterday. She's not here, folks, so I'm sort of picking on her. Ah, oh, man. Oh, I know she made those delicious blueberry muffins. That went great with that coffee. <laughs> but I have to talk with her. What kind of marriage relationship is that? Can you imagine? Well, from some people I've counseled with, I guess I can't imagine. But... See, unless we submit ourselves to God, we will stay parked at the easy place in our life. The other half of that law is the thing that is in motion will stay in motion unless a force interrupts it. When we came, when, before we came to God, the Bible says that broad is the way that leads to destruction. And many there be find it. You know what you have to do to be lost? Nothing. Nothing. Absolutely nothing. I'll let that sink in a bit. I know it's profound. Nothing. I find it really amazing when I talk with people who comment sarcastically about Christians and how they're wimps. You've never lived for God, have you? That's a different message altogether. So there needs to be a force that comes into our life. And unless we submit ourselves to the force of the Holy Ghost, we will stay in the exact same place or heading the exact same direction we have always been. When we come into the church and we receive salvation, the challenge, the, the misconception is that we're all set. If you don't stay moving toward God, inertia will set in and you will sit and park yourself at a comfortable spot. I personally believe, you can believe whatever you want, I'm not, not going to get in conspiracy theories or anything like that, but I personally believe that while all of this may be mankind at work, God has used this to try to cause his people to move off of flat, dead center. And if we don't move with him, according to the Old Testament, man, when that fire, that cloud moved, they better pack up their stuff and get moving, honey. Because God wasn't stopping. When he started moving, brother, he was moving. And if you're going to stay with God, can I tell you, he's moving right now. He's moving very rapidly. And if we stay parked in our comfortable spot, or if we've turned and started walking the other direction, let the Holy Ghost force smack you right up in the face, if you will, and get you to turn around and get us to wake up and say, yes, God, help me to rise out of this place of inertia and move into the power and the authority of the Holy Spirit.
Hmm. For every action, for every force in nature, there's an equal and opposite reaction. We understand that that's a law of nature that God orchestrated. But see, the Bible tells us in Romans chapter 2, verse 12, and be not conformed to this world, sorry, chapter 12, verse 2, and be not conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind that you may prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. I want to read that in another translation. And it says, oh, this, is, this hit me so hard. Don't become so well adjusted to your culture that you fit into it without even thinking. Whew. Don't become so well adjusted to your culture that you fit into it without even thinking. The Lord, I'm not ready to share this, but the Lord has been dealing with me about changing my worldview back to a biblical view. He's really been on me about this because I have found myself, yes, I'm committed to Christ. Yes, I'm committed to the Word of God. Yes, I want to follow it to, it, to the exactness of it. Yes, I want to do all that. But I find myself sort of slipping into a mindset, Pastor Betcher, that is more culture than it is Scripture. Again, that's a whole other message, so I better get off it because I'm not ready to share it, and that's not what this is about. So, moving on. Don't become so well-adjusted to your culture that you fit into it without thinking. Instead, fix your attention on God. You will be changed from the inside out. Readily recognize that what he wants from you and quickly respond to it. Can I tell you that again? Readily recognize what he wants from you and quickly respond to it. Mom and dad, parents, kids, have you ever heard some you know, parents say, would you please just do what I'm asking you to do and not drag your feet so long? Just go do it. I wonder how many times God looks down from heaven and looks at me and says, would you just get off, off the chair and do what I'm asking you to do? <laughs> he doesn't get, he doesn't, he's not human, so he doesn't get frustrated like I do. But you got to wonder sometimes. Unlike the culture around you, always dragging you down to its level of immaturity, God brings the best out of you, develops well-formed maturity in you. So that first part talks about adjusting to your culture. The last time, last part talks about the culture around us bringing it down to a level of immaturity. Uh, I want to be careful what I say here. So when I talked about the culture, my immediate thought, your immediate thought was that. The world. The culture of the world. I don't think he's talking about the culture of the world. I think he's talking about the culture of the church that is not being what the church ought to be. And it's really easy for us to slide into this thinking of comparing ourselves with ourselves. We turn out pretty good. It's not the scripture, though, is it? The Bible says comparing yourselves with yourselves, you make yourselves unwise. See, I don't have to measure up to Brother Gentleman. I couldn't anyway. You seen this guy? Phew. But if I... Please don't take this wrong, my friend. If I only measure up to Brother Gentleman, I may not be what God wants me to be. Now, I could say, well, I pray more than him. So what? Well, I fast more than him. Now you sound like a Pharisee. I thank God that I pray more than this wretched man over here. Jesus wasn't very happy with that guy. I don't know. I'm off my subject. So when we look at the laws of nature, we have to understand that in the spirit and in the physical, God is the God of the laws of nature. He is not held to them. He made them for us so that we don't go floating off into space without the law of gravity. <laughs> right? That'd be a bummer. Maybe some people you want to help along, but <laughs> but Jesus comes on the scene. He blows everybody's mind. And if you are honest with yourself and I'm honest with myself, the first time you see the stuff in Scripture, you go, whoa. 
Midnight, three o'clock in the morning, whatever it was, he steps off of ground, terra firma, and starts walking on water. Whoa. And it wasn't frozen, and he didn't know where the hidden rocks were. He walks up to the boat, and they're going, ah. That's the Keith Manley paraphrase of the King James Version. <laughs> He's in a boat and he's asleep. And all the disciples are freaking out because there's a terrible storm and Jesus is in the back of the boat asleep. And they're going, ah! Again, Keith Manley paraphrase of the King James Version. They wake him up. And he simply stands up, Pastor Betcher, and says, peace be still. And the disciples went, Whoa. What manner of man is this that even the winds and the waves obey him? They hadn't quite got the revelation that it wasn't the manner of man he was. It was the manner of God that he was manifest in human form. And so as that, he had complete authority even over the laws of nature. Stay with me, please. He fed 5,000 with five loaves and two fishes. He turned water into wine. He raised Lazarus from the dead after Lazarus was dead for four days, and now he stinks. He caused the lame to walk, the blind to see, the deaf ears to be opened. He was the master of all things. <laughs> so when we look at the law, this law of opposites and equal forces... If we're not careful, we fall into the trap of Satan and we get him, allow him to convince us that he is the equal and opposite of God. He's not. Can I say it again? He's not. Can you say it with me? He's not. He would like us to think he is. He would like to convince you that he is. He would like to make sure that you walk as if he is. But he's not. He's never been God. He will never be God. He can't be God because there's only one God. And we know who that God is. And Satan is not it. Why am I getting excited about this? Because Satan is a liar. There's a lot of things that have equal and opposite that's the way the laws of nature work. But when I look at Satan, I don't see the equal of God. I see an opposite. I see an opposing force with what you just prayed about. But I don't see an equal. He's not omniscient. He's not omnipresent. He's confined to time and space. Hallelujah. Because if he's bugging my good friend, brother Derek, he can't be bugging me. <laughs> he'll just send one of his imps and gullible humans that we are we listen to those things Satan is say it with me Satan is a liar and the father of lies Evil is not equal to righteousness. Darkness is not equal to light. Satan is not equal to God. Hmm. Huh. John chapter 1. In him was life, verse 4. And the life was the light of men. Everybody say light. And the light shineth in darkness. Everybody say darkness. And the darkness comprehended it not. That's a King James Version. You go, what does that mean? I can't comprehend what that means. <laughs> well, let me read it for you, or you can read it on the notes. In the message, the light life, the life light blazed out of the darkness. The darkness couldn't put it out. The Holman Christian Bible says the light shines in the darkness, yet the darkness cannot overcome it. Amplified version. The light shines on in the darkness, and the darkness did not understand it, overpower it, or appropriate it, or absorb it, and is unreceptive to it. Who? You wonder why sometimes you're witnessing somebody, and they don't want anything to do with it? Because they're at the darkness. The darkness doesn't want to be receptive to light. The net version, New English translation. The light shines on in the darkness, but the darkness has not mastered it. You know what? I, I was reading this and it really struck me that 
in talking about darkness and light, a lot of us think that there, in order for there to be light, there has to be darkness. And so we think that in order for God to be light, there has to be evil. No. There is evil. But God would not cease being light if there was no darkness. And in the book of Revelation, it says that in heaven, there will be no darkness. For the sun is the light thereof. Man, you're not getting that yet, but that's okay. First John chapter 1, verses 5-7. through seven. This then is the message which we have heard of him and declare unto you, that God is light, and in him is no darkness at all. If we say we have fellowship with him and we walk in darkness, we lie. Ew. And we do not the truth. But if we walk in the light, as he is in the light, we have fellowship one with another, and the blood of Jesus Christ, his son, cleanses us from all sin. Second Corinthians chapter 6, verse 14 says, Stay away from people who are not followers of the Lord. Wow, that's pretty straight. Can someone who is good get along with someone who is evil? Are light and darkness the same? It's a rhetorical question. No. So how can I walk in light and live in darkness? You can't. Light is not the equal, or darkness is not the equal and opposite force of light. If we turned out all the lights in this building, if you got up at home right now and you turned off all the lights in your house and you got one dinky little quadruple A battery flashlight and turned it on, darkness would have to go. It cannot comprehend. It cannot withstand. It cannot stop. It cannot resist light. And I'm telling you, I'm, why am I so excited about this? Because we know who, not what, we know who light is. Jesus Christ is the light of the world, and I am in him, and he is in me. That means right now, in this chaotic, messed up, crazy, ridiculous world, he is still light. And if you walk in light, you will never stumble. Who? My father, who was served in the military was off wherever he was off to, and came back to the city of Beloit where his parents still lived. And as he was prone to do when he got in late, he would just slide open one of the windows and crawl through the window into the house. Well, my, my grandparents passed away when I was five. I, I remember them. I don't really know them. But apparently, my grandmother had a propensity for rearranging furniture. <laughs> you, you already know where this is going. So, story goes, I was there, but... Opened the window, crawled in, started to walk across, only to find that all the rear furniture had been arranged, and you know what happened. It wasn't very quiet. All he had to do was take his iPhone out and flip on the flashlight. Oh, yeah, they didn't have iPhones in 1949. How can we, Pastor Stokes, who know light and have been received light, live in darkness. Can I, I, I don't want this to be harsh. I, I don't, and please musicians come. I, I don't want it this to be harsh or sound like I'm angry, but I, I need to say this to you. If we as the church are living in fear and doubt right now, it's because we've exited from light. This is what came to me. The only time I have an issue, listen to this, I don't know, I don't think I put it in the notes. The only time I have an issue with understanding who I am, what I'm supposed to be about, or the power of my relationship with Jesus Christ is when I step out of the light and into the shadows of selfishness, ego, self-centeredness. As long as I walk in the light, I will not stumble. I've already told you that Satan is not the equal of God. I want to share with you from the book of Luke, chapter 10, verse 18. In this 10th chapter, just so you know, Jesus had sent out the 70 disciples with a command. And they came back rejoicing. And this is what Jesus said. I've read this verse so many times. It never really struck me until I really read it today. Luke, chapter 10, verses 18, 19, Jesus told them, I saw Satan 
fall from heaven like a flash of lightning. I have given you the powers to trample on snakes and scorpions and defeat the power of your enemy, Satan. Nothing can harm you. Jesus said, in response to their statement, Pastor Betcher, that even the spirits had, they had dominion over them. Jesus said, I saw Satan like lightning fall from the heavens. You know what he was saying? It's not that Satan was in heaven at that time and fell out. No, what he said, this, if you look at the Greek, you know what he was really saying? While you were out doing my will, I watched. I watched what you were doing, and I saw the response of Satan, and lightning flashing across the sky. He fell under your dominion and authority. I don't know what that does for you, but I know what it does for me. When I read that and I came to that understanding, it was like, oh, yes, I have nothing to fear of him. He is defeated. He is defeated. He is not God's equal. No matter how crazy this messed up world gets, God is still omnipotent. Whew. Oh, yes. Romans chapter 16, verse 20. The God of peace will soon, the God of peace will soon crush Satan under, the Bible says, under your feet. Wherever you are right now, lift up your foot. Take a look at it. Your feet. We generally, I heard this as a kid, Pastor Betcher, that God was going to crush Satan under his feet. It's not what it says. Do you think the Bible makes accidents? Any mistakes? Huh. Under your feet, God, who is omnipotent, is going to use us, broken, frail humanity. This is making reference to ancient times and battles. Kings would go to battle, and the victorious king would capture the defeated king, and force him to lay down in the road or field or wherever. And as a sign and symbol of complete domination over he and his kingdom would stand there and put his foot on the neck of the defeated king. The imagery of that is that God has taken us, his people, his church, his bride, and he has caused Satan to be under our feet, with our feet on his neck, rendering him helpless and impotent. Yet we fear him because we think he's God's equal. No, he is not. Philippians 2, 9, 11. Go ahead and start playing. Therefore, God exalted him, Jesus Christ, to the highest place and gave him the name that is above every name. That at the name of Jesus, <clears throat> every knee should bow in heaven and on earth and under the earth. And every tongue acknowledge that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. I've always thought, Pastor Betcher, that's talking about eternity. That's talking about the white throne. That's talking about their judgment seat of Christ. Never says it. I read it and read it and read it for the context. It never says it. It never indicates that. Now, I don't, I don't it, it, it is true that at the white throne judgment, every knee will bow and every tongue will confess. But you know what that said to me today? It said that through the power, not me, when those disciples went out and came back rejoicing, they said, in the power of your name. They never took any credit for it. That every knee will bow in heaven and earth and under the earth. And every tongue of knowledge. See, we hear a lot of tongues wagging right now. All kinds of wickedness, heresy, idolatry, false doctrine, contrary to the word of God. Can I tell you through the power and the authority of the name of Jesus Christ, every knee will bow. To those who are vehemently opposed, hatred of the, of the things of God, their knees will bow and their tongues will confess. I believe prophetically 
through the scripture. I'm not saying I'm making a prophecy right now. I'm saying prophetically through the scripture that we will see in our living time people who have stood public opposing the truth of the gospel come to salvation in our time. And their knees will bow and their tongues will confess that he is Lord. Why should we be afraid? We serve the God of all gods, the Lord of all lords, the sovereign one, the creator of all things. He is my God, my Lord, my deliverer, my savior, my friend. Ha, this song, what a beautiful name it is, says, you have no rival. You have no equal. Now and forever, God, you reign. Yours is the kingdom. Yours is the glory. Yours is the name above all names. Wherever you are right now, would you stand as the worship team begins to sing this song? Would you begin to sing and lift up your hands and your voice to God? If you've been fearful, if you've been doubtful, if you've been despondent, discouraged, or depressed, if you feel like you need to give up and give in, my message to you today is don't because God has no equal. He has no rival. He is the God of gods and the Lord of lords. And he is your savior. He died for you and filled you with his spirit and has given you power to tread on serpents. Hallelujah.